I remember the professional 70s. career. In yeah, 70s, Mike. Mike was born in eighty one. I'm not buying it, Mike. <laughs> you were in your diapers. <laughs> yeah. No, no. But, I remember. I remember lining up in in the car, being in the back of the car, waiting for gasoline. I remember. Right. But you weren't Carter trading era. to Rod's point. No, no, I wasn't trading, yeah. but you were aware, ever aware. I was in farming. We had a mortgage. Listen, the way you squeeze the credit cycle uh, to its death and cause people to think about if they're going to go to dinner and a movie or pay off their mortgage because it's 18% on your mortgage, that's how you squeeze leverage out of the system. You change your, the behavior was so uh, different. There was so much less debt in the system and it, there was so, so much less overall aggregate debt and everyone was focused on paying their debt. If you chose to consume, there was a serious cost to that consumption because you had to, you could pay off your mortgage. You could pay off any debt that you had. So any, it was, my wife and I grew up in a place where you went out as a family maybe once a month. And you went out to a family as a, you know, dinner and a movie once a quarter. Yeah. And you look at the consumer society we have today and the habits we got into, which was, why would I ever pay off my mortgage? It's just rent. Housing always goes up. My payment always go down. Again, this is different in a 40s-like experience, in a 70s-like experience. This is all very different. And we try to make analogies of even 2000, 2001, 2002. It's worse. It's probably 73, 74, 75. And now we haven't even considered the aspect. We're talking nominal. I want to talk real. Or I want yeah, to talk that's about a good point. This is, this is, this is the mind. This is a mind. This is a specific. I had a conversation with an advisor today and he said, look, um, you know, I think, you know, I love, love what you guys are doing. This is a um, good offset, whatever. I think the best offset right now is cash. So we're raising cash and finding opportunities. And I said to him, listen, that's that's the strategy that has worked over the last roughly 40 years because there's no downside to getting into cash when equities are going down. But there's a massive downside when you have inflation at 8%. All of a sudden, this idea that cash is trash has to come into the site. And he, and he, had, he was having a hard time with it, right? He's like, well, I don't understand. I have opportunities to, to buy at a lower price. And my answer was, well, you had opportunities to buy it and even higher price by in transition to things like commodities or CTAs that are making you money, right? That's your right, but if they don't that's do that, that but, if if they, they do but if their mindset can't even wrap around that, they're kind of right. Like, if, let's just say we knew perfectly that like 8% is eating away their cash position, but then the S&P is down 30%. Like, what are they better off in, right? Having the opportunity to, to, to rebalance that cash back into that at the low, low nab point. Like you're saying, in a perfect world, you would have held commodities that would give you hopefully a convex cash position to inflation and you would have been able to buy at a better nab point. But like, that's, that's not how people operate. And I'm curious, like, you, how you guys think about this is like, you know, the whole thing, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. About, like, I mean, you know, we use these historical analogs, like Mike's bringing up like 73, 74, or even the 1940s. The problem is like, it's never going to be the same as that. And I, I get worried that we... We, we really we really try to tag into these historical analogs because it makes it feel that we understand this market. But like like you were saying, Mike, even when you guys are going out like maybe once a month as a family, but you also didn't have Internet. Like so it's like like how, how do well, these Jason, Jason, you're I just let me you are. I want to just say you are absolutely right. Timestamp that. Yeah, no. a hundred percent. The, the challenge no, is so we teach or we share as human beings with story and analog. I think your caveat is incredibly important. It's probably not a caveat. It's probably the main line, right? Is listen, this is different. This isn't the seventies, but there's some characteristics that have some structural impacts to asset prices that are similar to that. And those things you should be paying more attention to because this ain't the two thousands and the two and the, and the 2010s. This ain't that. So, right. The problem is people are super identified and comfortable with and have a, an overconfidence driven by a recency bias of the experience they've had lately. And they think that's what's going to continue and they plan from the achieved level. And when you have a regime shift of some kind, it's all we can say is it's different. Here's some other times that were different. Please look at these because you need to sort of internalize that it's not going to be like it was. And so what else can we do? We're just trying to do the best we can. We can bring up Japan, right. we can you, bring up emerging markets. 
Go ahead. So you're, say, you're saying that you got, we should prepare, not predict, and we should be adaptive. <laughs> you see, <it? laughs> some those words do sound familiar. I mean, look, the, the, what I what I want to push back, uh, Jason. I know you like to go turtles on us. <laughs> nothing ends up working, and there's nothing that rhymes. But the reality is that there is. Look, let's go back to you all know Harari, right? We are we are human beings that have built narratives, and those narratives are human um, uh, end up adding up to being somewhat predictable uh, human interactions, right? What that cause and effect relationships of what we care about, right? So what does inflation inflation cause human beings to do and how are they predictably likely to act and what asset cl classes are likely to make money in that environment? So there's a few inflation growth dynamics, liquidity dynamics, right? Sentiment dynamics that we can understand are likely to be a certain thing in any one of these regimes, right? So inflation causes people to, uh, to, to spend less money on gasoline and drive less. And what, what are the knock-on effects of that? The, if you examine that, and then you know, okay, I should allocate, I should have exposure to all these asset classes, things that will react to these things. Bonds, equities, commodities, maybe some active management and long, short, multi-asset. My issue is that and, and so that, this is where I get you understand that dynamic, you have the tools in place, and then we can talk a little bit about, you know, the, the cockroach portfolio and prepare, preparation versus prediction. But what bothers me is the, even if you examine just a little bit, how those dynamics affect our asset classes, that most investors today still don't have the asset classes in place, just in case those dynamics happen, right? In case there is a liquidity shock, in case there is an inflation regime. We still are in this world of only believing that the dynamic that works is high growth, low growth. That's it. Yeah, I think right? I think it's 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 not that we, and it's not just us. Obviously, everybody who sort of talks about the importance of understanding economic regimes makes similar points. The points are not we're entering the seventies or in, we're entering the forties, and and so you need to use the same playbook. The point is to sort of jar investors out of their um their trance right they're sort of their the, the lived experience leading to overconfidence in a certain type of approach um because this approach has worked well over you know the past five or ten years and to sort of just illustrate to point to examples of where the approach that they think is gospel is the only way to think about investing long term has some major blind spots. And here are some examples of where those blind spots cause damage, but acknowledging that the current environment is not going to look like the 70s, it's not going to look like the 40s, it's going to be its own environment, but it's going to be an environment that challenges the consensus view on what the a, appropriate kind of strategic allocation is. So let's, let's first start with... Um, we acknowledge that that let's say sort of typical global 6040 um, goes through multi-decade periods where it underperforms cash and underperforms or, or delivers negative real returns, multi-decade periods where it delivers negative real returns. And acknowledging that, what are some of the tactics that we can aim, add to our portfolios in order to give ourselves a better chance of being successful? regardless of what economic environment that we face in the and market environment that we face in the future, no. right?